exclusively, it's applied to for all nodes, um, to all nodes in the left subtree and all nodes in the right subtree. And then we can express the search tree predicate for all nodes T that has an L, K, V, and R. Um, then uh, for all nodes L in the left subtree, the key at L, that is J, is less than the key at this node T. And for all nodes in the right subtree, the key at that node is greater than the key right here. And now we can prove that our example tree, um, let's prove that it satisfies this property. So first of all, let's unfold search tree X just enough to put this in what's called head normal form, HNF, head normal form. That says unfold this only at the head enough so that you can't do that anymore. And so here's the property uh, for all nodes. And we see it's doing this at uh, node two and node five and node two again and node five. Let's simplify that. All right, here's what we have to prove. Two is less than four and true and true. Where do those trues come from? They come from uh, the E, leaves of these trees, where for all nodes says, yeah, empty, empty nodes are all right. Two is less than four and five is greater than four and that's actually all we need to prove and a bunch of trues. So we can do repeat split. The repeat tactic, remember, keeps applying split until you can't do it anymore. And then in each remaining sub goal, let's do auto. And auto can solve true. And it turns out auto can also solve five greater than four. Um, all right, so I claim that this is not a search tree with this, this bogus tree with the three uh, at the left subchild of the two. And we can prove it's not a search tree. So there's a negation there. So let's do intros. Now we intro the negation and then we simplify above the line. And we have a lot of interesting facts above the line. So let's destruct H three times. And how do we prove this contradiction? We should use the theory of linear integer arithmetic to prove that three less than two implies false. So there we go, omega. All right, so there we have a pretty good definition of what it means to be a binary search tree. And now, here is the statement of the theorem, right? That if X is a well-formed binary search tree and it satisfies the abstraction relation to the abstract value contents, then its elements relate to contents in the appropriate way. Now, this theorem is true and it's provable and it's the right theorem that we want to prove, but let's not prove it because this formulation of the binary search tree property is really hard to prove things about. It's got nested for alls. It's got a for all this, and then there's a for all inside. And so we're gonna have nested inductions everywhere. It's gonna be a terrible mess. This is the wrong formulation of the search tree property for actually doing proofs with. So, here's a better formulation of the search tree property. Um, we're going to say that a tree is a search tree bounded by a low and a high key if, well, if it's an empty tree, then at least low has to be less than or equal to high. If low is less than or equal to high, then the, this empty search tree E is bounded by low and high. And if it's a tree with this K, uh, key, K, then the left subtree has to be bounded by low and K, and the right subtree has to be bounded by k plus one and high. Okay, so there's no nested for alls in there. It's a nice, simple inductive property. 
Uh, and then at the root of the whole thing, a tree is a search tree if there exists any low and high, but we'll just choose zero for low since we're working in the natural numbers. If there's a high value such that the tree T is bounded by, um, by zero and high. Now, there's something a little ugly about this because we're using the natural numbers. I would have liked to put a less than here instead of a less than or equal. And I would have liked to get rid of this successor. I don't want to do ar arithmetic operations on my total order. Um, and then that would have been fine. I could define this, but then I would need to use a minus one here, which I don't have handy in the natural numbers. So if we do this in a totally ordered type that happens to be unbounded in both directions, uh, then we can make a slightly more elegant definition of this property. But this is fine. This will do the job. Okay, so um, here's a lemma, an important useful lemma about search trees. For any tree T, if it's bounded by low and high in this inductive definition, then low is actually less than or equal to high. So um, we can prove it by induction. When you use induction and you haven't bothered to intro all your things yet, Induction one means find the first proposition, proposition number one in the order of arguments, and do induction on that one. So intro, 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 induction, and then uh, do omega on the result. Why does that work? Well, in the base case, omega works because it can prove low less than or equal to high from low less than or equal to high. And in the inductive case, we have two induction hypotheses. Low is less than or equal to k by induction, and successor of k is less than or equal to high by induction, and so omega solves that one as well. So that's nice. Um, what were we trying to prove here? We're trying to prove that elements is correct as long as the input is a well-formed binary search tree. And first, we had to work on the definition of well-formed binary search tree so that the induction is nice. Now let's work on elements. Remember what elements is. It's a call to elements prime. And elements prime is a nicely optimized linear time traversal of this tree that doesn't use any list concatenation. Okay, but it's not very nice for doing inductive proofs over. The uh, proof that elements is actually um, satisfies the abstraction relation, it'd be nicer if we had this definition of elements right here. This is a more naive, straightforward definition of what are the elements of a binary search tree in order. Well, the elements of the empty tree are the empty list, and the elements of this tree are, well, the elements of the left subtree concatenated with this key value pair for the root node, concatenated with the elements of the right subtree. That's a nice, simple, beautiful definition. Unfortunately, it takes quadratic time because list append right here takes time proportional to the number of elements in the left-hand argument. So we wouldn't want to use this for computation, but for reasoning and for proof, it's very nice. So we'll define slow elements then we'll prove that slow elements computes the same as elements, or rather that it's equal, right? It's equal by extensionality. So we're gonna use the axiom of functional extensionality, which is uh, used here by the tactic called extensionality. Extensionality S says, well, if for any argument S, elements of S equals slow elements of S, if for all arguments S, then elements equals slow elements. Okay, so now we will do, uh, well, the proof is part of the exercise. You can do that in the homework. Um, and so now we're gonna do some proofs about slow elements that are gonna be related to this uh, abstraction theorem about the elements function. 
So here's our theorem. If T is a binary search tree bounded by low and high, and the key value pair KV is in this association list, slow elements of T, then K must be between low and high. This sounds plausible, but you know, by this time in the morning, after you've sat through 50 minutes of lecture, you would probably believe anything, right? <laughs> so uh, I urge you not to believe this until you think about it, or until you prove it, or both. <laughs> now, I do actually believe that you could prove this without thinking too much about it. <laughs> this is just typing in cock. Okay, so, um, but that's a useful theorem that uh, uh, if something is in slow elements of T, it's actually in the range that T is bounded by. Okay, um, when we're gonna do this proof about elements, it'll be useful to know that uh, either a key value pair is in an association list or it's not. Or in particular, a key is in an association list. That's this exists V in IVAL. Or there is no value for which that key is in the association list. And we just do that by induction on the association list. Here's another useful auxiliary lemma. If the key I is in the association list and we calculate a total map from that association list, that's list to map, except we, we calculate the total map of AL appended with BL, then um, we get the same key that we would get by just calculating list to map of AL and looking up I. So why is this? Well, list to map is a recursive function. Which way does it insert all the values of uh, AL uh, append BL into the list? Well, from the right. It's right associative. So we take the last value of BL, we map a key value pair into the empty total map, and then the next to last value of BL, we add that, so if the key i were in BL mapped to some other value v, then by the time we insert all the things in AL, that would shadow that definition and replace it with the one for v. And therefore we get the same thing as if BL weren't even there. Okay, so that's the theorem. Um, who believes that, and who believes it even more because you can see that it says QED here? <laughs> right. So, cock is great. If you're not sure whether something is true, you just type until the QED works, and then uh, it must be true. Okay. Um, so here's another auxiliary theorem. If the key I is not in a tree AL, and we make a total map out of AL append BL, and look up I, we get the same thing we'd get as if we looked up I in BL. And that's because AL does not shadow that key value. All right, sounds very believable. Now it seems even more believable. Okay, uh, here's a third auxiliary lemma. If uh, the key I is not in AL, then when we turn AL into a total map and look up I, we get the default value. Sounds plausible enough. Now it's even believable. Okay, so um, we can prove elements relate. This says, if T is a search tree, if T abstracts to contents, then if we take the elements of T and turn that into a total map, we get exactly the same map as contents. And here's the beginning of the proof, and then the rest of it is the homework for you. This does not look easy. It's not that hard, but it's not short. You'll find that the proofs uh, of the lookup function and the insert function are actually much more straightforward. 
You know, when you do those for the homework, they, they won't be difficult. You'll have to do some sort of induction over something, of course. Um, so I'll talk about why it turned out this way in a little bit. Um, now, we need to know, so we know that if a tree is well formed, then it will uh, behave correctly with regard to the abstraction relation. But how do we know our trees are going to be well formed? We have to prove that our trees are going to be well formed. So we have to prove that the empty tree satisfies the representation invariant. That's this theorem, that the empty tree is a search tree. That's an important part of the homework. It's not too hard. Um, we have to prove that if T is a search tree and we insert something in it, then the resulting tree is a search tree. You can prove that, not too difficult, just use induction. And we have to prove, what do we have to prove about lookup? We have to prove if a tree is a search tree and we look up something in the tree, then the tree is still a search tree. Well, that's obvious. Lookup doesn't re return a new tree. This is a pure functional programming language. So there's no actual proof obligation in this regard with respect to lookup. The proof obligations are whenever you build a new thing of this abstract data type, you know, search tree or whatever, you have to prove that it satisfies the representation invariant. Okay. Um, well, um, in general, when you do this for your fancy high performance data structure and your abstraction relation with respect to the simple abstract notion of what it's supposed to do, and you have to prove this kind of abstraction theorem, um, you'll need to use the representation invariant as well as the abstraction relation, right? So remember, what was the thing we could prove about lookup, right? That you'll have to do this in the homework. That if uh, a tree relates to contents and you look up a, a key in T, then uh, it's the same as looking up the key in the total map. But the more, but let's look at elements relate. This says, something similar, but also requires that T is a valid search tree. Why didn't the lookup lemma right here require that T is a valid search tree? And the answer is, it should have required it. It's just that our proof didn't happen to need, to need that. So it's interesting to ask, you know, here's the general form of the thing you would need to prove about lookup. That if T is a search tree and it relates to an abstract value contents, then uh, the lookup. So we can prove that from the other lookup relate uh, that you're going to do for the homework, right? Lookup relate has this premise and it doesn't happen to require this. So that's all right. Uh, we will apply H0. This is not some sort of linear logic where you have to use every assumption, thank goodness, um, and, and that's fine. So the point is that this lookup relate prime is the more general kind of thing you have to prove, and it just so happens that we didn't need one of its premises. And the same holds for insert relate. So why did this happen? Let's look again at the abstraction relation. We have this combine function. Remember what combine does. It glues the parts of A that are less than K to the parts of B that are greater than K. It throws away the bogus parts of A and the bogus parts of B. So this abstraction relation is tuned exactly to how the lookup function works. It's no surprise that uh, the lookup function found that this abstraction relation was all it needed to prove 